So Byron, um, as Akash said, you've got this very sexy slogan for opportunity at work, um, which is rewiring the labor market. And, you know, if I think about what's going on at the moment, we have your former, um, your former employee, your former organization, McKinsey, saying that 45% of, of work today could be done by robots. People are pretty scared by that. So a lot of people worry about, gee, are there going to actually be any decent jobs in the future? On the other side, we in universities tend to say the problem is we just need more general skills, so higher a college participation is the way to go. But you actually, your rewiring concept is all about demand supply mismatch. Could you give us sort of the opening salvo on that and then maybe we can dig into some more stuff? Right. Okay, so uh, why rewire the labor market? There's a lot of, uh, obviously there's a lot of uh, talk about jobs, there's a lot of anxiety about jobs, um, uh, from the, the quality of jobs to the automation of jobs. Uh, and it is right that we should be focusing on jobs, and that we, particularly that we should be focusing on work, because uh, uh, you know from every possible angle, uh, this is the most important economic issue. It's, you know, two-thirds, 70 percent of uh, the, the, the capital stock of the country is in, say, human capital, you know, say roughly the same proportion of uh, gross national product comes from uh, labor. Uh, uh, we, we think, uh, as we think about the labor market, we tend to think about people uh, offer, working as uh, supply, you know, sort of, sort of businesses, employers, as the demand side, people as the supply side, or, or maybe training institutions as the supply side of human capital. But it, it's a curious sort of market uh, at a very deep level in the sense that, uh, so the person who's working, um, uh, an economist, you know, simple Econ 101 model assumes that every, like everybody would rather just sit around and do nothing. And that it's you know it, it, you have to like give them something in order for them to go do something right. That's why it's supply and so the supply and demand curves, um, and that's true at one level. I mean, people work partly because they're paid. On the other hand, uh, at people as a consumable, <laughs> as an experience, meaningful work, something that you're doing that matters, uh, that engages you, that you think makes a difference, uh, has massive benefits. Uh, in addition to the pay. So, Byron, can I can I just stop you there before we get into yeah. the, the the rewire? I think that's a profoundly important observation. I was just saying to you that you know, Karl Marx is rolling in his grave because Marx said all those years ago, the problem with labour in a capitalist system was it alienated you from who you are. We're living in a world in which labour defines who you are. So, you know, a, a, a utopian future in which machines do all the work and we sit on the beach doesn't seem to be the one that people believe will be fulfilling lives. I mean, how, how do you think about this big meta-philosophical level? And then maybe the second part, the political level. You know, Bernie Sanders yesterday said that Hillary Clinton is unqualified to be president. Why? Because she signed trade deals that um, supported trade deals that uh, have exported American jobs. So, you know, the centrality of this to the political debate right now is incredible. What's your big picture take on the role of work in life? Right. Well, there's a lot of questions rolled into that, and um, a lot of only um, two really. Marx and of, Bernie. You know, what do they yeah, have in common? I don't right. know. Right. Okay. So I'm gonna I'm going to um, start uh, radically oversimplifying and like start shooting a few things out there. So just stop yep. me when it gets too much. Okay. So a um, uh, 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 first thing is this is the most important economic question there is. Asked in the right way, answered in the right way. Um, this is the basis of uh, the next major uh, surge of of economic growth that transforms society managed in the right way. Um, uh, will robots take all of our jobs? Uh, they, they, they only will if we are uh, abysmally, stupidly self-destructive as a society um, because work is solving problems. Work is meeting needs. Last I checked, we still had problems and still had needs and robots aren't going to take that away. Uh, the kind of automation you're going to see is going to be very, I mean, it's, it's really going to be pretty remarkable at one level, but um, I don't believe it's going to be anything like as fast, for example, as the, the space in which agriculture declined from, let's say, 85% of the, the population to 15% of the population, right? In some countries that happened 
really fast. Okay, know? so economists, and you know, you did economics at Yale, you then did a yeah. PhD at Oxford in economics. Economists at this point tend to smile. They say, you know, the, the history is with us, trust us. We don't know where the new jobs are going to be, but don't worry, they're going to be there, right, as they were in the, trend, in the Industrial Revolution. Other people say, no, this time is different. There's something about IT and AI and everything else that's different. Similar or difference in big technological changes? So where the economists are right is that uh, the demand for work done by people in, in principle is not gonna is not gonna go away. And there'll be lots of new ways to to sort of add value and uh, technology certainly historically is, has been much more likely to augment sort of people ultimately than than to replace them. However, where the economy what the economists gloss over for the most part is how did that happen? How did this massive automation uh, you know, of, of agriculture happened and yet people still had jobs. Well, part of what happened in the United States is that communities across the country saw that they'd worked on the farm, their parents worked on the farm, but their children were not gonna be able to work on the farm. Um, and that they, but there were jobs in factories, and there were jobs in these offices, and these, you know, this, all of these things were coming online, but you needed a different set of skills. But there was this concept called the high school. It was, it was private academies mainly, mainly on the East Coast, um, and uh, a little bit after the, you know, just before the turn of the century, it was maybe 9% of Americans went to high school. And then 35 years later, 80% of Americans went to high school. And there was no department of high schools, there was no department of education. What there was was a high school movement across the country, townships across the country, but what that, what that movement had are three things. They had, a mo they had a curriculum model called the high school that educational reformers had created. They had a governance model called a school district and a school board, and you could hold a town meeting and decide you wanted to have a, 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 a school, and, and therefore you elected your, some of your neighbors to be the school board. And then they had a financing model, which was the local property tax, and you could vote to tax yourself so that you could hire a teacher and bring this curriculum. And then it could be, you could have a free public education, a high school education that would allow uh, your, 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 your kids to grow up and get jobs, not just in farms, but in factories and in offices. And there were many other things besides, but that happened in 30 years, the heart of it, the high school movement. Okay, so that's a big, su that's so, a big but, supply but, but, side change, But the point right? is, well, yes, but more important, that, it ha that happened to be a supply side change but the biggest thing is was institutional change. And I think that's where economists tend to fall short, is they don't look seriously at the institutions. So back to this rewiring yeah. of the labor market, what we're, the, the, the reason we use that term is because uh, the problem is the structure of that market. And particularly, if you look at what's changing and what's changed, it's not really the supply side of education and job training, it's the demand side. It's the way the employment contract works. It's the way that 30 years ago, uh, businesses mainly hired entry-level people out of high school, out of college, out of PhD programs. Uh, Peter Capelli, who's here at Wharton, has shown how dramatically that has changed, and now it's 6% of hiring is entry-level hiring. Most of hiring is, I need someone with 12 years experience that sort of looks like this with these degrees and so forth. So you now have a, a system where um, actually uh, the demand side the actual core of the demand signal, the job description, is, is this description of what you have to have been doing the last 10 years of your life, and implicitly, the last 25 years of your life, right? So until we have time machines, that's not a real demand signal. That's a search algorithm. That says some people can and some people can't. Okay, so massive stuff in there. So general education versus specific training, on-the-job training, you know, do you poach workers or do you, do you skill your own workers up? Where does a diversity agenda fit in? Algorithmic searching for jobs uh, that Peter, certainly Peter Capelli, has been very down on. I mean, there, there are so many big issues there. Can you bite off the specific so what, what's, the, what's the best action plan going forward? Do we change the way we do formal education? Do we try to overcome the collective action problem of train versus poach? Where does diversity fit in? You, you, you know, you want to have concrete steps. What's, yeah. the, what's the order? So, um, uh, uh, it's, 
uh, there's 160 million adults in the U.S. labor market. You know, payroll is $8.5 trillion. It's an incredibly diverse market. So it is not the case that one single step sort of solves it, mm -hmm. but there is a pattern to what the solutions need to look like. And there are three critical elements of a solution uh, that fall under rewiring the labor market, and then there's a, a thousand specific things you could do under each one, and there's some you can do now. Um, the first and most important is that there ha that more and more of our job market has to be, uh, people need to be hired um, uh, based on uh, what they can do, not, not just what they've done. You have to hire um, based on skills, hire based on competencies, not based on pedigree, not based on history. That's got to change, and it's got to change enough that you can create a genuine demand signal that allows the second thing to happen, which is that any person, wherever they are right now, whatever they know, whatever they can do, um, uh, they have uh, the, the information uh, and the institutional support to, find, to get to a better place, to work and learn to their full potential. Um, and that'll be a variety of pathways, and there's a tremendous amount of innovation going on on that side uh, between you know, MOOCs and coding boot camps and all of that, and a lot of that can work if the demand side is right, because today the biggest problem is there are already hundreds of thousands of people that can do these millions of jobs that employers can't fill, and those people can't get job interviews. Okay, now, but that's a, that's a really interesting point, right? So the reason you're conjecturing that there's a, and I'm sure this is true, there's a mismatch between people's ability to do work and the credentials and the history that shows that they've already done the work, let's say. But credentials are a pretty efficient signal, right? So how, how can you efficiently identify talent if it's not visible on the resume that then you know, these algorithms are going to filter so that you and I only get to interview the 10 people who fit the job description? Talent is a tough one, right? The, the good news about credentials is they're there on the piece of paper. Yeah, credentials are, in a way, an efficient uh, 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 signal, but they're, they're not necessarily uh, always an effective signal because what is a credential signal? Uh, today, most credentials that are meaningful in the job market are signals of brand, are, are signals of prior selection. They're signals of a whole series of selections that have um, uh, certainly some information content, but they do not signal what you can do, what you're capable of. And you don't pick any uh, set of credentials, selective college, uh, unselective college, community college, and what you'll find is there's a massive overlap in abilities across those, but uh, we have made those uh, today, and, and uh, algorithmic, uh, you know, the, the sort mm -hmm. of whole algorithmic job search has been met because then people can apply for, you know, hundreds of jobs. Uh, it's been met with uh, algorithmic job screening, right? Because companies can't interview thousands of people. Yep. And so, the, the, it, ironically, at a time when we can know so much more about what a person actually can do or can't do, these crude indicators have become absolute barriers. So, uh, 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 administrative assistants, 20% of administrative assistants in this country have college degrees today. Uh, according to Burning Glasses Data Analytics Company, 65% uh, of new job listings last year for administrative assistants required a four-year bachelor's degree to be considered. So think about that. 80% of administrative assistants working in their field today cannot apply for two-thirds of the new jobs in their field, no matter what no matter how much they've kept up with their craft. This is, so the paradoxes you're seeing uh, are really dramatic, and if you want to understand them, though, you have to dig into the structure of the market. So the most open jobs we've had, more or less, uh, since we've been measuring it, at the same time, the lowest level of prime age working force participation in 40 years, right? You have this... Uh, uh, you, you actually have declining, at a time when the economy is so dynamic, jobs are changing, uh, you actually have a 25% decline in voluntary job mobility, and people quitting their job and getting a better job, right, on purpose, right? Think about those secretaries who can't move, right, out of their, their current job to go get a, get a better one. Um, that's a huge part of what's compression, compressing wages. And, and so you, you, you've got this backwards, and, and it is, um, 
So what you're seeing, it, when all is said and done, if you measure it all, 160 million people in the US labor market, at 80 million of them, give or take, roughly half, you can point to very specific reasons why the way the system works today absolutely disadvantages them relative to what they can do. They are barred from advancing in into well-paying jobs. And remember, this is not then just a matter of fairness. It is a matter of fairness. And it gets to the diversity point. But the, 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 bias, that, that the bias that you see along the diversity dimension in hiring, uh, I would say, is, is, a, as, is an example of a larger class right, of, of, of bias against people that don't have uh, specific credentials, people who've learned on the job versus, uh, you know, learned in an elite. Okay, sort of so let's say setting. that's true. Yes. We've still got this challenge if we're the hiring person. The search costs, the the cost for me to identify talent is really high. No, that's so how do we lower that? No, that's that? absolutely right, and that's the heart of the matter. So the thing is, if you are a, a company, and especially you, you, you were an, an HR, you were a hiring manager, or you were an HR uh, uh, staffer in that company, it is not your job to figure out best allocation of talent for the whole market. It's your job to, of all the people you could hire, try to find the one you think might be best, but most of all, don't take any risk that you're going to have a bad hire. So in your role, you would rationally accept 20 false negatives, 20 people who would be great at that job and you don't hire them. That's better for you to avoid um, one bad hire, someone who you actually do hire. That's where your pain point is. And that's every, so, and so everybody's using like pretty much kind of the same signal, certainly in sort of professional, technical jobs. And so the false negatives are the same for all these companies. So you, you then have the situation where the people who actually worked and found some way to learn these skills, they will act, unless they've got a personal connection that will vouch for them and walk them through the process, which because of the, the, the social, um, uh, you know, the social divides in this country is not likely to happen for many, many people. Those people will not be able to navigate the system even if they have the skills. So when we talk about it as a skills gap and we try to solve it exclusively through more education and more training and so forth, that is, that is way too late because yes, in the last round of interviews, you're trying to figure out who can really do the job. But in the first five, you are screening based on pedigree and history, things that people can't change. So if you want to change the system, the first thing you need is you got to create a sit where if you can do the job, you can get the job. And companies, sadly, cannot, probably will not create that for themselves. This is a market problem, but it's a market-based collective action problem. But government and the nonprofits who work in the sector, they can't keep up with the market-based part. Like that information to deal in the market is in companies, but companies don't have departments of collective action. So when we say rewire the labor market and what we're doing is we are creating, in fact, this market-based collective action layer. So if you think about it, there's now a lot of ways to solve uh, collective action problems uh, from platforms to open source to, I mean, it's actually, I, I, it's, it, no one can explain to me why the problem that Airbnb has solved of millions of strangers sleeping in bedrooms next to millions of other strangers they've never met and everyone feeling like that's not, no one can explain to me why that's a harder problem. And 10 years ago, if we were talking about this, we almost certainly would have said the problem we're talking about now should be a more straightforward problem to solve than the one that Airbnb is. Okay, so, that, so that's a massive challenge and opportunity, as, as you've said, and, and it, it's a fantastic thing because it's got both efficiency of outcome and fairness and equality, it's going to hit both dimensions. But no surprise, our conversation and your remarks have been eliciting lots of questions from our audience. And you know, there, there are some on, the, on this, the, the more micro side that we've been talking about, but also some very macro ones. So you know, we're, we're living in a world now where immigration, trade, and technology are all viewed as job killers. Um, What's your, how do you respond to that? I mean, you know, economists have a simple response, but the, the economist response seems not to work as a matter of politics. How do you respond to the immigration, trade, technology, uh, are eating jobs claim, which is clearly pretty, it's got a lot of traction in this electoral season. Um, the, the, the biggest, I think the biggest reason, <coughs> um, it, again, technology is, um, 
uh, does it, like people can get pretty uh, heated about sort of what technology does. But um, if I give you a hammer, you know, you can build me a house with it or you can smash my head with it, okay? Hammer's a pretty robust technology, but it doesn't tell you if something good is gonna happen or something bad is gonna happen. It depends on what you do with it. And so when you look at the impact of technology, both in the past and going forward, what are, peop what are we incentivizing people to do with that technology? I can tell you the technology of, that allows people to, to learn faster, to retain more, to uh, sort of tap into their best way of learning. Like there's, those technologies are advancing tremendously as well, but the business models are not. The business model of add software, remove labor, ka-ching, ka-ching, repeat, that is a robust business model. It's not that the technology is more robust, it is that that fits our current economic paradigm in which 99% of the most economically capable institutions in society are turning the crank to optimize returns on invested capital. That's the capital a company can own. Machines, software, dollars, patents, goodwill, all of that. Everything that you guys could measure down to the nickel here at Wharton, okay? But it's not meant, our system is not designed to optimize returns on human capital because companies can't own human capital. They only rent it, it's an input. It's not an objective function. And uh, if you want to stretch your brains, try to make a list of five meaningful economic institutions that are actually designed to, uh, to help someone make the most of their human capital. I, I, and I mean that literally, to, to sort of optimize it. Not just that you, know, you can sit in some classes and whatever. They're, they're, they're not existing. So actually the, pro the human capital problem, which is real, the returns from which are realized in the labor market, that is as complicated a problem. All that goes into that is as complicated as all that goes into the valuation of a company and the very complex deployment of, of resources and competitive. But instead of a company with reams of accountants and Wharton MBAs and technologists, you've got Joe Schmo or Mary O'Leary on his or her own facing this thing and trying to figure out how to optimize it with incredibly limited information very little institutional support. Okay, so that's hard. We talked about identifying talent. What about developing talent? A couple of questions here about the, you know, develop talent, poach talent kind of challenge. You know, we see it in, you know, we, we think about technology firms. They decide, do they invest in their own innovation or do they just wait till somebody else innovates and they buy the best, right? The Silicon Valley move right. these days is to say, let's just wait and see what works and we'll pay a premium for buying it. That seems to be happening on the labor market side as well. I presume you think that's a problem, not, right? Again, it's efficient yeah. in one sense, it's not collectively efficient. Well, I want to defend Silicon Valley first because there definitely are Silicon Valley strategies of like wait till the technology is developed and buy it. But I think it would be unfair <laughs> to tag, Silicon Valley is the place probably where the most uh, long-term investment uh, actually is going on in, in these sort of ideas, but less so around people yep. and, and more so around other sorts of uh, advancements. But, but I think I, I want to answer that question and tie it back to uh, people analytics mm -hmm. um, because the, uh, I think the heart of the question, uh, if you were to put it in people analytics terms, it is, is people analytics uh, going to be um, analytics of people or analytics for people? Right, because the question of the, the tool has a lot to do with uh, who wields the tool, uh, who, who does the tool work on behalf. So all these analytics right now, because of the, the competitive structure that they are, they are sitting in, um, they are all used to stratify and to include and exclude, right? They are, they are used, um, uh, they're absolutely optimally used to select talent rather than to build talent because the ROI on selecting talent that others have built is far higher, right, in the short term than the ROI of building talent yourself. But if everybody gets these tools and it's all in the hands of companies who have that roughly that same incentive structure, then what then who creates the talent, right? Before there were any people analytics, big dumb companies invested like hell in tons and tons and tons of people reams of people out of high school, ro loads of people out of college, and they didn't know how to work, they didn't have all these specialized skills, and they built them, they created them. No people analytics. What are we gonna do? We have this work to do. We'll hire these people, they seem pretty good, let's go, let's work with them. With people analytics, only in the hands 
of the, of the companies, right? First it's cranking on cost, and now it's like stratifying on, on value. Pr I will predict what your value is gonna be before you have a chance to show it. Now, put people analytics uh, in a different frame, right? Not, yes, with companies, but also uh, with the, these new business models that are meant to optimize human capital, and then very importantly with the people themselves, right? Where, where they are supported in the choices that ultimately only they have to live with for the long term. If there's a people analytics that actually uh, is structured in that way, which is partly a, a matter of business practices, it's partly a matter of public policy, but very much a matter of innovation and business model innovation. Um, if that happens, then people analytics, right? People analytics is a field that's about to explode. But is it gonna explode like a bomb in our faces? Or is it gonna explode like a rocket taking us to new levels? So that's a, that's a pretty good place to end and we're only one minute and six seconds over. I didn't wanna stop you in, that, in your last set of remarks, Byron, because I think they were fantastic ones to frame this entire event. Um, I, I think we should always be uh, accountable to the schedule because there are so many other fantastic people to, to be on the podium. Please join me in thanking Byron for framing the stage for us today.